Welcome back to the show. Well, today we're discussing air travel in Canada, aviation professionals losing their jobs due to the vaccine mandate, and Canadian mobility and conscience rights with Greg Hill, founder of the advocacy group Free to Fly. In 1881 and 1885, the Canadian Railway was built to unite Canada from east to west, fulfilling a commitment extended to British Columbia when it entered Confederation in 1871. It was Canada's first transcontinental railway, and it became a symbol of national unity and connection for all Canadians. Fast forward to today, our airlines serve the same heart and purpose in our nation, connecting families and loved ones, facilitating commerce, and giving us all opportunity to see the beauty of each corridor of this nation. That was until recently, when federal vaccine mandates put an end to domestic travel for millions of Canadians. Seemingly overnight, families living in different parts of the nation have been separated, with some not seeing loved ones for over two years now. This, in spite of the fact that the right to travel freely within Canada is actually a charter right enshrined in our Constitution. In addition to this, recent federal and industry policies have led to job losses for thousands of Canadians in this sector. Joining me today to discuss is Greg Hill. He served as a pilot in the military and then also with a major airline. He's also the founder and co-director of Free to Fly, a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to defending the conscience and mobility rights of Canadians as it pertains to this sector specifically. Thanks so much for joining us today for this important conversation. Let's get to it. Okay, well, let's dive right into it. So you started this organization in the spring of 2021 with another individual named Matt Sattler uh, because you were seeing some charter breaches, uh, you know, really a creeping barrage coming into your profession, uh, the aviation profession. First off, give us a bit of your backstory of who you are and how you relate to the profession and why exactly you felt you needed to start this advocacy group at this time. Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I came career-wise out of the military myself, so I spent a full career uh, in the military. Well, full career, I, 20 years, and then I spent about another 12 years in the reserves after that. And then I got to uh, to the airlines back in 2006. Fast forward to April of 21, myself and Matt uh, got together and we figured we'd probably be on the leading edge of any kind of vaccination mandate. And that was uh, the 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 the, uh, the birthplace of free to fly essentially, and from there it just uh, it expanded into other uh, elements within the aviation industry, flight attendants, air traffic control, what we call under the wing workers, be they maintenance, um, ramp uh, ramp crews, customer service, the full the full gamut. So we've got just about three thousand aviation professionals within free to fly, and then another very importantly. Uh, 39,000 passengers whose uh, mobility rights and freedoms more broadly have been attacked uh, over these past two years. So that was really the birthplace of, uh, of free to fly. Okay. And so when you're talking about the mandates, basically what you're alluding to is at this point, aviation professionals that have lost their jobs because for one reason or another, they didn't feel like they could take the vaccine, maybe a medical reason, maybe a conscience reason. Um, is mm -hmm. that correct? Am I basically understanding the bottom line of the purpose of your group? Well, it is, but it goes beyond that. Obviously, we hear heartbreaking stories every day about people whose family members are dying on the other side of the country, uh, and they want help. They want advice. They're, they're trying to figure out what to do. So it's it's there's an aspect of it for sure that's about the aviation industry itself. Uh, but I like to say it's a selfless uh, group where we're looking at the full spectrum and, and not just the 42,000 people within Free to Fly, but really uh, the, the rights and freedoms of every Canadian coast to coast. And we've been vocal and passionate about that, whether that's platforms we're blessed with, like, like this one with you, or whether it's speaking uh, on Parliament Hill um, during the convoy at rallies uh, or, or other means. You know, you're, you decided that this was the moment in your career that you were 
kind of willing to lose it all in terms of your career for the sake of, of principle. What was that about for you personally, Greg? Um, well, my father was a military man as well. And so I, I would say from a very early age, the concept of, of liberty and freedom uh, were near and dear to my heart. I got into the military because, uh, because I believed in that. And when I saw what was happening in terms of our individual uh, ability to speak to personal autonomy and otherwise, it, once you lose the, the ability to decide what happens to your own body, I'm not sure, I, I, I'm confused, I guess, why other people don't see it as important, but we've seen over the past couple of years, all these other freedoms as well, whether it's peaceful assembly, whether it's uh, the freedom uh, freedom of, uh, of speech, whether it's the freedom to gather uh, as believers in our churches or, or otherwise. Uh, to me, it, it, it got to the point where everything um, in terms of personal comfort, convenience, uh, and even safety to me are willing, uh, I'm willing to lay on the line. And and that's because life is about trajectory and where we're going. You know, as a pilot, if we're doing an approach coming in for landing in, in Calgary or wherever else, and you start to drift off the center line, you better darn well uh, fix things rather quickly uh, or you're into the weeds in a very, very dark place. And so I look at the tra trajectory of where our nation is going, and that's why this is so important. And the history of tyranny uh, be it, you know, 50, 75 years ago or over 500 or more years ago, is that we only uh, succeed in, in pushing back when there is an, a willingness to suffer uh, personal loss. And, and, and the, I think that's part of the challenge with where we're at is society more broadly um, wants to find a way out of, of what's happening here, but, but concurrently be able to hold on to comfort and convenience and everything else. Uh, and power can seize nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. The only way to, to really push back against it is being willing to, to give something up. So, so for me, that's really where, uh, where, it, uh, where it stands right now. And uh, it's, it's been a dramatic change for, uh, for our family, for sure. Uh, we sold a, a, a larger house that we had. We've moved into something smaller. I'm now working uh, in, a, in a little factory here in town. Uh, but I always say my... my um, my conscience is clear and my soul is intact. Um, it's uh, at the end of the day, it's truth that matters and it's living by truth. So, Yeah, and it's such a wild time. You know, we hear from viewers all the time and there's kind of two groups of people out there. One are those that are like, yeah, go Greg, like be a voice. This is amazing that you're taking a stand. And then the other voice is kind of like, you know, guys, like chill out. You're just being conspiracy theorists. theorists. It's not, it's not as bad as everybody's saying, but but when I look at you and you're saying that you have 3000 people standing with you, that it's not a conspiracy theory that they lost their jobs, like they actually lost their jobs. Right? Mm -hmm. So so what do you say to that voice that's kind of maybe wanting to pacify um, the concern that you're raising? And let's talk about those 3000 members that you have with your organization. Have all of those people lost their jobs and, and what are some of the you know, the examples that you're seeing? Well, not all of them. There's there's a good portion. Um, I, I couldn't sit down and, and give you the stats on all 3,000. But but within that 3,000, I think an important point to make is that within that group, there's there's those who have decided to get uh, to get these injections themselves. And, and maybe after the fact, they've decided, you know, they're not uh, comfortable with it now. Or maybe they are, and uh, and they just feel that the the lack of uh, of an ability to make that choice for those of us who, who are now out of work is is unacceptable. And we're in conversation with those uh, those type of people all the time, as well. So I, I think what we've seen happen over the past month or two has been has been powerful in terms of seeing the narrative uh, start to change with what we saw in Ottawa, and that was a very polarizing. Um, affair as well. But, uh, you know, people say, well, is it really right to be um, blocking bridges, for instance? Uh, and, and in normal times, I would say, well, I, I would struggle with that as well. But when you've removed the final catchment uh, in, a, in a democratic society in terms of people's fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, and you say to them, you don't actually get those anymore, what's left for those people is very, very little, and it can go to very dark places. 
Uh, and so I think those that that took the opportunity, let's say, to go to Ottawa and see what was going on there, saw that as you as you just asked me, kind of those that that say, well, is that true or is it a conspiracy? There was a lot of people we talked to firsthand that said. I had an idea of what it was going to be. And, and when I saw it firsthand, it was different. And so this is where I, we really feel that the narrative is so important and, and Free to Fly is committed to that completely, is having these individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and helping them see the reality of what's happening to our nation and the trajectory with where we're going. Uh, you and I are talking primarily about, uh, about mandates right now, but I say to people, that's the tip of a very, very dark iceberg. Uh, there's an idea that once we get past this and COVID is gone and these mandate, mandates roll back, that we're, we're going to be heading back into sunny skies. And I don't want to be uh, Mr. Eeyore to summon some Winnie the Pooh uh, imagery, but uh, I, I really feel this battle for freedom is going to be a battle that we fight for many, many years to come. And we look at digital currency, digital ID, and otherwise. These are the things that, that, in the back of my mind, I'm probably more concerned about than what you and I are talking about right now. So I think we need to steal ourselves for a marathon. This isn't a short race. Uh, we need to form communities where we can really, really support each other uh, because it, it can be challenging for people for sure. And I think faith is such an important part of, uh, of getting through these challenging times. So. Well, I appreciate how level-headed you are uh, about this. You can tell that you're a very well-reasoned individual. And, um, you know, I really appreciate even your personal approach to this. So I want to dive into the labor laws. Okay, so this is something that is right on the pike right now, right on the table, uh, that could affect not just the aviation profession, but all federally uh, mandated um, jurisdictions, you know, for labor within the federal domain. So Unpack yeah. that for us and why that's something that you're flagging right now with your organization. Right now, uh, the mandates for us in terms of the uh, the aviation industry, we're, we're governed by what's called an interim order. So every 14 days, the government re renews it pretty much rubber stamps it and rolls it out again. And that's that's the requirement under which the unvaccinated are not allowed to travel. And those of us who are not jabbed within the industry no longer have employment. Um, that affects rail workers, uh, marine but for, for much of the rest of the industry, let's say the banking industry, uh, some of them do have mandates, but they're allowed to test, et cetera, et cetera. Well, behind the scenes, uh, late last year, the government added into what's called the Forward Advisory Plan their intention to enshrine it within the Canada Labour Code for all federally regulated employees uh, and elements of the public service. So to make a long story short, uh, that is about 1.3 million workers in this country but the really concerning part is the government claims that they consulted with stakeholders in December of last year. Well, they didn't put it into the forward advisory plan until the 10th of December, which means they had, being generous, maybe 10 days to consult with 18,500 employers. And even to suggest that they, they did a, you know, a quarter of those in 10 days is, is preposterous. Furthermore, they initially said they weren't going to put it in uh, what's called Canada Gazette 1, which is essentially advising the public, hey, here's what's coming, and then you get an opportunity within a democracy to express your uh, your thoughts on it. Well, they, they basically said, we might just go straight to enactment. Now, they've since, over the past few weeks, backed off on that a bit, but um, it's very, very concerning because there's there's it's a hints here and there. We're all watching the media, and, and there's there's controlled leaks that are kind of testing the waters, like boosters kind of got out in the media, about a week and a half ago, or maybe two weeks ago, and then it got quiet. So this Canada Labor Code thing, it's its kind of boring. Like Even as I'm talking about it, I feel guilty because it's not terribly interesting for your, uh, for your viewers, but it's incredibly important. And this is the problem with what's much of what's happening in our society. It's the shock and awe campaign of bill after bill after bill that chips away at the very foundations of our rights and freedoms and our democratic society. And people are overwhelmed because there's so much coming at them. And something like the Canada Labor Code isn't very interesting to talk about, but it's going to affect 1.3 million uh, employees in this country. And once it's in the Labor Code, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to undo compared to something like an interim order, which by very nature is, is theoretically uh, short-lived and temporary. So basically what we're talking about, it's, sometimes it's hard to even find the right words to say, but you know, mandated medical government coercion 
uh, not just for the aviation sector, but for multiplied other sectors. We know that it's already impacted the medical profession, our federal employees. But what you're saying is the circle is just going to get larger if this labor code is amended. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's all federally regulated industry. So there's there's things in there, like I said, oil and gas, uh, the banking, communication, uh, uranium mining, the uh, the grain elevators, like things that you wouldn't typically think about. And and importantly, there's the final line in there says uh, something along the lines of industries that support uh, these other employers. So so there's there's an additional uh, catch all for for a lot that you may not even think of off the top of your head. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely very concerning because it, it just starts to, to lock things down further and further. Wow. So, so eye-opening, Greg, honestly. And I, I want to say this about our viewers. It might sound like boring content, but our viewers are sharp pencils. I know they're, <laughs> I know they're tracking with this conversation. And many of them have been personally affected. I get emails all the time from parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, individuals directly that have personal stories of vocational right. uh, loss because of the federal mandates over this past season. We believe in giving back and doing all that we can do to build a better future. What that means is that when you partner with Faith Teen TV, you are partnering with so much more than an issues commentary show. You are partnering with a team that is constantly pouring out to serve Canadians and pray for them and their loved ones through special TV programming and our phone lines as well. You are partnering with at-risk youth through the children that we sponsor every single month and programs we actively partner with like the World Embrace Champions Centre and Children's Park in Gulu, Uganda. You are partnering with national prayer events where we gather believers from sea to sea in united prayer for Canada. You're partnering with the Life Room, which has already mobilized thousands of hours of prayer for the unborn in our nation, and with the Justice Wall, which mobilizes prayer for issues such as human trafficking, youth suicide, conscience and faith freedom, and for good government in Canada. When you stand with us, you're standing with every ministry that we actively sow into through our tithe. One person is a voice, but together we are a powerful force that can do so much good. Thank you for your support of Faith Teen TV and thank you for being a part of this team. Together we truly can leave the world better for the sake of future generations. We appreciate you and every gift really makes a difference. And so where do you see things going from here? So you guys are raising, you know, raising concern about these things. You've got 3,000 aviation professionals, 39,000 Canadians that have signed on. Are our elected officials, are they listening to you at all? Or uh, what's been the response? Uh, underwhelming would be the one word answer, which probably resonates with, with your viewers, I think, as well. Um, you know, it, it falls right now along political lines to a certain extent, but even then, the, these the communication you have with your elected officials i always say start local and move up don't don't send a letter to justin trudeau if you haven't talked to your mayor yet right like start start at the grassroots level and then and then work your way up it's important um they're probably not going to read an eight-page treatise but but they are tracking with what their constituents thinks which which brings up the point of uh culture essentially and and we're very uh, firm believers that the narrative is really the battleground right now. If you if you look at case law, if you spend some time on Canley and have a few hours and want to read uh, the, the the COVID rulings, let's say over the past six to nine months, it's not going well. Uh, it's not going well as far as the charter uh, goes. Whether you're you're talking about what happened in Nova Scotia, Manitoba, Alberta, BC, uh, the judges have taken a side when it comes to COVID. Uh, and sadly, uh, and we t we talked about this ourselves uh, a few weeks ago. The law has become downstream of, of politics, and Brian Packford um, speaks of this as well. In, in I believe what he says is something along the lines of, the lines of uh, judges in his day were not friends of politicians, they were friends of the law. And so at this point, it, it, law is, is downstream of politics, and I firmly believe politics is downstream of culture. Said another way, that's we're we're dealing with populist governance. The government is is uh, is essentially doing what the people want rather than providing true leadership. Ergo. Culture is really everything, which is the narrative. And the battleground is the narrative. And it's convincing enough Canadians, a tipping point, I call it. It doesn't have to be 51%. It has to be enough firmly committed, freedom-loving, passionate Canadians who want a, ch a world that their kids and grandkids can live in 
uh, that is is something other than dark authoritarian uh, totalitarianism. Uh, and if we don't arrest ourselves from the, the trend that we're on, I fear that's that's where we're headed. And and you just spoke about um, these individual stories that you hear, and they're so very important. Uh, these stories are important, and it's one by one work sometimes, and it feels painful and glacial to people because we want to have the big win, right? We want to have the big rally where we convince ten thousand people that this is important. What really needs to happen is individual conversations, whether it's with family members, with your employer, with your neighbor, can, because people don't even know uh, that, as, a, as an example, that we can't fly right now in this country. Uh, when we were really locked down here in Ontario, people would invite me out for a coffee, knowing that I'm out of work because of this jab mandate. And I'd have to say, uh, I'm not allowed in a restaurant, right? Like people don't understand it. And that's why these important, these conversations are so very, very important. So that's a big part of what we're doing is helping people understand where we're at and where we believe we're going. Uh, and a lot of times that that's done relationally uh, in, in respectful conversations. Now, again, some people would listen to this conversation right now and say, you know, listen, Greg, Fatin, like there's lots of things that the government says that you have to do uh, in order to abide by the law. Like you've got to be 18 to drive. You you know, you've got to be able to see to drive. You know, there, there are boundaries that the government puts on uh, our function in society um, because they deem those boundaries to lead to the safety and protection of other citizens. And I think that is a valid point, obviously. Um, the one thing that's different about this conversation I'd like to open up because we haven't talked about this yet is the reality of the the number of adverse incidents that that we're seeing. Even the mainstream media is reporting this, talking about it. Every once in a while, you'll see an actual story of someone who had a, a blood clot or a heart condition with with the younger generation, et cetera. And so, right. you know, in the aviation sector, safety is always first. We know that. So when it comes to adverse incidents, the safety conversation, um, let's just talk about that for a second. Is this anywhere in the mix of your dialogue as you talk to Canadians about what's happening here? Well, it very much is. And, and this is free to fly was born out of out of that um, that safety culture. We wanted to, to position ourselves as those that are absolutely dedicated to, to safety and are the ultimate risk mitigators. Uh, ask the spouse of any uh, pilot how much fun it is living with somebody who's constantly looking for everything that might go wrong. I mean, that's just how we live, right? So what we've created now in the aviation industry is, is very, very troubling. Um, your viewers may or may not have seen last week, there was uh, an American Airlines pilot, a Captain uh, Robert Snow, who had a heart attack shortly after landing in Dallas, I believe it was April the 9th, and he spoke out from the ICU, still plugged into all sorts of machines, and he was unequivocal in his barely concealed rage at having been coerced into a vaccine and the fact that his career was probably now over. He would not be able to teach his daughter how to fly, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I say all that because it, it's, it hasn't trended at all. If you look it up, you won't find it anywhere within the legacy media. But this is a gentleman who spoke firsthand. Uh, I'm speaking firsthand with some of our pilots within the industry that are similarly uh, finding uh, adverse effects post a vaccine who are expressing similar amounts of rage. But, but the point I want to make is the Canadian aviation industry, along with most in the developed world, is bound by something called SMS, safety management system. And that is, it, it's, it's a culture where even if you do something in an airplane where, where you mess something up, um, you admit it with immunity. You say, I, you know, I turned right on a taxiway when I, I thought they wanted me to go left. And, and, and then the culture as a whole discusses it, tracks it, and, and mitigates risk that way. But what we've created now is an environment where the gentlemen, uh, you know, several that, that, were, that I'm speaking to myself and others are speaking to, uh, to others within their airline communities, they are uh, vaxxed harm. They're, they're suffering from things that are very concerning. Um, but to speak up, you're going to come up against uh, almost a prosecutorial environment because you're questioning this vax orthodoxy. And so what you've got now is, is one of the biggest elements in a safe flight is that the crew members, whether they're, they're, they're the people in the pointy end or those walking the aisles in the back looking after customers, don't feel that they can speak up and say, I feel that I've got a problem and I feel that it's related to this vaccine that you forced me to get. 
uh, and sometimes they've spoken up and they haven't been uh, they haven't been listened to appropriately. So it's it's a very very concerning scenario. We're hearing it both north and south of the border. I'm not as in touch with the community in Europe, although we're associated with some groups there. But certainly uh, north and south of the border here in North America, uh, we're starting to see this, and and we're we're asking the unions representing these employees as well as the airlines to at the very least create a permissive environment where these employees feel that they can say listen this is what's happened to me uh, i'm really concerned about it and and i want to be able to uh, to address it appropriately but but i would say right now uh, they're not feeling that so we want to be careful with, with what we say and not be inflammatory uh, but at the same time We've been we've been talking about this. We gave our, our unions uh, a document put together by doctors and scientists back in September, raising alarms that these doctors and scientists said of anyone. We're concerned about pilots because they sit for long periods, and these there's these these the vaccines have vascular risk. Um, and the unions said absolutely nothing to this day. They have not even acknowledged that document. Uh, and I've said this publicly several times because I find it so absolutely shocking in an industry that is so ostensibly predicated on safety. Absolutely. This is so incredibly eye-opening. And there's two factors that are eye-opening. One is what may be happening, may or may not be happening to the aviation professionals. And then number two, the lack of reception to compassionate conversation when someone is having a very real health experience in the midst of their vocation. And so uh, there's two things here that we need to probe into. So I appreciate your courage. <laughs> you and I both know it takes courage to edge into these conversations in the current climate. But I think if we love Canada, if we love Canadians, if we love our, our fellow Canadians in the aviation sector, um, these are conversations we need to be big enough to have. So I appreciate your willingness um, from the bottom of my heart. So as we begin to uh, close here today, uh, where can Canadians find you and how can they get involved or support your mission and mandate? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, free to fly.ca and that's uh, free, the word T-O, fly.ca. That's our website. Uh, you can join up there. That'll get you... Uh, on our, our mailing list for uh, for our newsletter. Uh, we've got all sorts of social media on there as well. We've got some other videos, uh, like the labor code issue that I, I mentioned. Uh, we've got a Rumble channel where we outline some of that for, for any that might be either impacted by it or concerned about it. Uh, go into it in about 10 to 12 minutes, go through some of the documentation online uh, to get people up to speed uh, there. So that's that's where they can find us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for shedding so much light on this important conversation. And honestly, we'll be watching closely uh, the good work that you and your colleagues there at Free to Fly are doing. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you appreciated the conversation and I sure appreciate your engagement on these important topics for our nation as well. If you want to watch this show again or share it with your friends, simply visit fateen.tv where you'll find this show as well as other previous episodes also for your viewing convenience. I also want to remind you that we have a free smartphone app you can download and you can also get on our email list. If you do download that app or sign up for our emails, you will be notified each time a new program is aired so that you never miss a show. Lastly, we need to give our weekly wholehearted thank you to all of our monthly partners, our regular donors. As a nonprofit TV show, you are the ones that have kept us on air for the last three years and you continue to keep us on air. So thank you so much. If you'd like to sign up to become a monthly partner or give a special gift today, we would be so grateful. Simply go to fateen.tv or call one 866 844 and our team would be honored to serve you in any way that we can. Thanks again for joining me. I hope to see you next week.